This is Chuck Huber, the voice of Android 17. You're listening to Anime Seekers. You better be, or I'm coming for you. Dragon of the Darkness, flame! Toku Secrets is a podcast run by the Anime Secrets website. Check us out at AnimeSecrets.org for more anime, video game, tokusatsu content. Remember to follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts today. Hey guys, I'm Hunter Dino. I'm your pink Dino Fury Power Ranger and your red Cosmic Fury Power Ranger, and you're listening to Toku Secrets Podcast. Welcome to Toku Secrets. Join us as we journey into the marvelous world of Super Sentai, Kamen Rider, Power Rangers, and many other Tokusatsu. Get ready for the adventure of a lifetime. It's Morphin Time! Link to the Morphin. I'm Nathan Desai, the dazzling adventurer, Spoken Silk. I'm Patrick Allen, I'm Shinkin Red. And I'm Ridwan Merkin. Go Kyle Red. And I'm Anthony Davis. Also known as Curie Green. And, and we're, we're Toku Secrets. Secrets. What is going on, people? This is the Toku Secrets Podcast presented by AnimeSecrets.org. And uh, today we are continuing our little journey through Seiji Sentai Gingaman with the whole crew on again today. Uh, last time we took a look at chapters 27 through 38. And today we are continuing our journey all the way up to until the end game arc. So that means that today we're taking a look at chapters 39 through 47. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, not as much as last time. Last time we had some pretty heavy-handed stuff. I mean, 12 episodes. What are you going to do? But uh, this time we got some uh, pretty decent stuff to talk about. So, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, as per usual, we're going to start off with a recap of last time. Um, so the big thing that happened last time was that the ball bond got visited by a space merchant named Biznella. Um, he, this was Deviat in a Power Rangers Last Galaxy, and he revealed the three steel star beasts. So the shark carrier, Gigavitis, the red land-based robot, Giga Rhinos, and the blue sky-based robot, Giga Phoenix, who he found these star beasts. They were injured while battling the ball bond, and then he modified them to become mechs and tried to use them against the Gingaman, but then the Gingaman turned them good, and now they've joined them. Uh, Ryoma gained access to a new motorcycle called the Galio Pulsar, which is created through the Gingalites. Uh, the um, Elias's time as the uh, field commander ended when she took matters into her own hands in desperation, and she was killed by the Gingaman. The ball bond took this jewel that contained her soul to stop Titanix from rotting because Titanix's heart was reborn. Bukratis got banished. Badobas took over and he set his sights on trying to restore the heart of Titanix to fully revive it. Uh, Goki and Suzuko confessed their feelings for each other and they're kind of in a relationship now. Um, and the big thing that happened at the end was that Hugo was forced into service by a vengeful Bukratis. Uh, Bukratis captured and injured Gotoris and threatened to kill him unless Hugo didn't serve him. And now he's basically using Hugo as part of like this plan that he has to kill Zahab because he wants to get revenge on Zahab. And Hugo isn't telling the Ginga Man what happened, but they've more or less kind of accepted that they have to act separately now. But they're confident that they'll be... Uh, reunited again and that brings us to uh where we are now chapter 39 this filler episode called the heart's massage which is a saya centric episode but before we get there we also probably yeah. want to tell the audience that Hyuga ate a herbal plant that made him lose his earth power yes i forgot about that that that's a very important detail um so uh saya centric episode um where so a lot of these next couple of episodes kind of revolve around um, the a lot of the Gingaman kind of taking Hugo's departure a bit differently. In the case of Saya, she wants to fight better for Hugo's sake, and that gets her into kind of a pinch because uh, this new Ging this new Bado Boss monster is going around trying to make people bigger so that they can like massage. Uh, it's kind of a funnier plot point, but it's like they want he wants people to like massage the Titanix's heart and Saya accidentally gets turned big. Um 
Now, throughout, um, th- so in this episode and throughout most of these next couple of episodes, we're seeing what Hugo's up to while he's not fighting. Uh, here, he's working on a mysterious weapon. Bukrakis is, tel- is helping him. And it's revealed to be this large axe that Bukrakis calls the Night Axe, which is which he claims is key to defeating Zahab. Um, uh, the Night Axe did appear in Lost Galaxy, sort of. Like, in the Lost Galaxy saga, there's like these one or two episodes where Mike, where Defender Torozord suddenly has this axe with no explanation. You might recall that. It's a much bigger deal here in Ginga Man. And, uh, and the one last note to make is that uh, Bazookas, the Monster of Davis episode, is one of three Bado Boss monsters not to be adapted in the Lost Galaxy. This is the second. The, the first one was in the previous batch of episodes. Uh, but yeah, what do we think about this episode, guys? Eh. <laughs> I don't have really have an opinion on this one. That was my reaction. I was waiting to see who was going to say eh first, to be honest. Because... <laughs> This is the most whatever episode. Um, I mean, there's really. another one I call that, but this is a this is definitely a whatever episode to me as well. Like, I don't know. I think it was fun, funny to kind of see the four guys get fat, but mm-hmm. other than that, I mean, eh. I I thought I mean. I, I guess I liked the catalyst of like Sh- Saya. Well, I mean, first of all, it's nice to have that Saya gets an episode, you know, as a follow up to Hugo breaking away from the team. And I think the catalyst for her, like wanting to be better for Hugo's sake, was great. Just kind of think that them kind of ultimately transitioning into a more comedic episode. I mean, it's not bad. Like, I mean, it, I mean, it's pretty much just a filler, but. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's better than some of the filler episodes we got in the last batch, but still. Um, yeah, it, it, I agree with you guys. It's mostly whatever. At least nobody got offended by a tomato. Yeah, thank God with that. Uh, what do we want to give the, uh, this one out of 10? Five. Just five. <laughs> it's, a, it's a five for me, too. I'm going to agree with five here. Okay, yeah, five is fair enough for me. I'll, yeah, definitely, because it's just whatever, nothing bad, nothing good. All right, next up, uh, chapter 40, The Monster of Sadness, uh, which is it, uh, this episode. Uh, it's kind of the beginning of a three-parter, although it's more of a it's more of a prelude to a two-parter. But um, so uh, in this episode, Bado Boss dispatches a sacrificial monster it's part of his latest scheme to uh, revive Titanix. And the monster, his name is Dagius. He's an aging monster. He joined the Ball Bond after being defeated by them as they destroyed his planet. He's sent to, basically he is sent to enlarge and collect energy from a meteor passing by Earth so that the Ball Bond can use the energy from the meteor to revive Titanix. But he wants to have one last battle before his death and he gets into a fight with Hikaru. And Hikaru actually defeats him, but refuses to kill him. And then Biznella uses a control collar to force him back into his service. And unfortunately, the Ginga Man are not successful. Um, he does get the energy, and the energy strikes the Titanix, slowly reviving him. And uh, the episode ends with Deggy is dying from the energy you know, sad that he failed to protect yet another planet, and Hikaru sticks his sword into the ground to pay his respects to him. Uh, and as per with the other episodes, Hugo only appears briefly in this episode, training with Bukratis with the Night Axe. So, uh, what do we think about this one? I loved it. I've, I always have a soft spot for these episodes where you have like a a disgruntled like ex hero who's kind of who had like one mistake and just wants to go out in his own honorful way. This reminds me a lot of that. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen Samurai Jack all the way through, but there was an episode of Samurai Jack that had the same plot. And mm-hmm. I don't know, that was the first one that came to mind for me. 
that 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 Samurai Jack episode is incredible, by the way, if you've ever seen it. It was a tearjerker at the end. <laughs> yeah, I actually missed a Samurai Jack boat. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I think it, it's a show that I think you would get me. some enjoyment. It's a show I I can see you getting some enjoyment out of. It's 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 very artsy, but it's incredible. Yeah, in time, right? yeah. No, I don't have anything against it. I just didn't want to watch the art style. But I definitely would be interested to watch it someday. I'm not opposed to it. I mean, Riz, you're going to have to watch the art style when we review the 2003 Clone Wars series. So Yeah, Gendy Tarkovsky. Yeah, Gendy did me. both those shows. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure did. I was trying to put that thought off for a little while, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I... I thought this is a really great episode for Hikaru. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this gave Hikaru the growth that he needed. And I think it worked in his favor to have this. And also, like Patrick said, I just love when the villain of the week turns out to not really be a villain, but a disgruntled employee. And yeah, I liked his background a lot. Yeah, I honestly, like, so the Lost Galaxy episode uses roughly the same plot, except minus the whole trying to revive the Titanic thing, because Titanic's, I mean, it sort of exists in Lost Galaxy, but it doesn't have, but it didn't exist up to this point. Um, like, yeah. it, uh, it's more like, you know, the monster is just sent to, like, you know, destroy the Rangers, because, like, he's friends with Villamax, and he wants one last final battle, which is fine, but, like... I, I feel like it worked a lot better, both because, I mean, first of all, it still revolves around Maya, and Maya is not exactly a really good Yellow Ranger character. And, you know, here, this is, like, great development for a character who, w- with each one of these podcasts, I'm starting to realize that I completely misjudged Hikaru when I first watched uh, Ginga Man, so... Yeah, I mean, it, it worked a whole lot better, and honestly, the ending is a bit more gut-wrenching, because... Like with Lost Galaxy, it's just they defeat they defeat um, uh, Loyax and that's it. But like here, it's much more terrible where you feel sorry for him because he failed to defend his planet and had to join the Ball Bond. And now here, he just got used to revive this giant monster and he dies before he can do anything else. Like, man, <laughs> you just got to feel sorry for this guy because he did not go out in the way that he would have ideally wanted to. It's kind of sad, to be honest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you want to add anything, Anthony? Um. It's, it's pretty, I don't know how to say this. Because it won't, it won't, this won't, literally will not matter until, like, way later but uh, like I'll mention it now is that uh how you pronounce his name uh Bizera is that his name is that his name who Deviat's counterpart yeah yeah uh Biznella Bizella no Biznella Karma I always say it's Car- Biznella yeah. Biznella yeah Karma's gonna get you that's all I'm gonna say oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Karma gets this idiot hard later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, the funny thing is, is that despite those criticisms I gave the Lost Galaxy episode, I still really liked it. Now, granted, I probably gave the Lost Galaxy episode a ten out of ten because you kind of got to take what you can get with Lost Galaxy. But here's the thing: I like this episode a whole lot more then I like the Lost Galaxy episode, and it does have a lot of genuinely touching moments. So, yeah, I mean, unlike unlike some other people who try to limit the amount of 10s that they give, I don't really have much of a limit. I, I'm actually going to give this a 10 out of 10. Fair. I, I don't quite think it's 10 material, but it's definitely a solid 9. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. This to me is a 9. Mm-hmm. Not because I'm trying to limit tens, but you know, I, I still think this is a nine in terms of quality. Yep, I agree. 
especially with this and Hikaru's next focus episode or like his two best moments in the whole series. Yep. And uh, Anthony, you agreed with a nine? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, now we're going to move on to, uh, so like you guys may have recalled what I just said, um, the last episode, so this episode ends with Titanic slowly reviving. And this episode, chapter 41, The Demon Beast's Revival, is pretty much the beginning of a two-part episode revolving around the final battle with Titanix. Uh, so m- m- not much happens with this episode as far as like character is concerned, but there's like a lot of story stuff that's happening. And there's also a lot of filler in this episode, which I'll talk about when we at- when the other guys have given their opinions. But pretty much what happens is that Titanix starts uh, reviving the Gingaman Rush to rush to fight him and they have to fight off against Bado Boss and the Yartots and then Titanic shows up and they ha- and they try to fight him off with all the mechs. Then Huga gets involved um because uh Bucrates decides well Bucrates at first wanted to unleash Gotorus to stop Titanix because remember Bucrates is he's also against Zahab. He may be a bad guy but he doesn't want the ball bond to win either. But then they get attacked by Zahab and Ryoma gets hurt while trying to fight Zahab because he tries to use the Night Axe, but it critically injures him since no one who has Earth Power can touch it. And the episode ends with uh, the Gingaman get cornered by Titanix and the mechs, and Zahab takes Ryoma's own Seijuken and stabs him with it. So, uh, yeah, what do we think about this one? Um, This... I always thought that this was the beginning of the the final arc because this feels very like the tension is at its highest here. The thing that they've been scared of the whole season, literally jumping out of the ocean in front of them, like th- that's that shot visually for this era of Sentai is really good, by the way. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but just kind of everything kind of coming together here in Rioma having like his his like scariest moment with not sure what's going on with Huga still and seeing how strong the have is and everything getting this is like a dour moment but it's 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 good tension especially Dytonix being hyped up as this planet buster from the start of the season and seeing how he's living up to his reputation it's yeah it's 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 good stuff i think it's terrifying man like <laughs> i was like oh my god like and then the fact that you know what happened in the end with hugo i was just like mm. i like Hugo, but um Real, Yoma. Like you said. yeah the the one gripe i have with this episode is like so i said earlier that there's a lot of filler in this episode because i mean think about it like we see the entire gingaman roll call there when they summon the mechs we see all of the individual summonings of the star beast then the full like transformation of them into their into their silver star beast form then we see the full uncut gingayo sequence and then it shows the full sequences of gigavitis appearing Gigavitus unleashing all of Giga Rhinos and showing its full sequence, and then Giga Rhinos unleashing Giga Phoenix and showing its full sequence, like all in one episode. Oh. Like that, you're kind of going that was annoying. too overkill with the filler in there. That's what I meant. They, that's why I meant it. This makes it feel like a final battle. When in in the eyes of the Ginga Man, it kind of was, but was still like eight episodes to go. <laughs> I feel like you should have saved on to this moment a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to... Yeah, I agree with you, but I'm going to have to wait until like we get to like two episodes later to get my thoughts, because I definitely agree. This Titanix battle is happening a little earlier than it probably should, which is kind of ironic, because uh, as much as I hate to give Lost Galaxy credit for stuff, like that like 
th- this big fight with uh, Titanix, this actually happens. Um, that so the thing that does become the final battle in Gingaman, that episode's footage is used for an episode that takes place before the Gingaman, the Lost Galaxy Rangers fight the equivalent of Titanix here. Like it's kind of switched to where, th- and it's not the final battle because. The final battle is where uh, Mike has to fight Bado Boss's counterpart. Then they escape from the Lost Galaxy. And then Trakina says, yeah, I'm the only villain here, bitch. And then she kills Captain Mutiny and everybody. But uh, um, yeah, as much as I hate to give Lost Galaxy credit, they at least had the right idea to have Titanix be the final big bad, sort of. Uh, Riz, did you want to add anything about this episode? Yeah, I was going to say... Um, it's been a long time in the building for us to finally get Titanix uh, starting to appear. And yeah, this is a pretty tense episode with a lot of things going on. Um, namely, just the fact that it, you know, Ryoma and Zahab had that epic fight. But um, I, I have some thoughts that I'm going to hold them until part two. Yeah, that's fair. But uh, yeah, I, I'm definitely very much enjoying the tension going on here right now. And what do we all want to give 41 out of 10, guys? Eight. Yep. I'm going to go with an eight. Yeah, eight for me, too. I think I'm going to give it a nine, honestly. Uh, yeah, that's fair. It's pretty tenacious. Uh, 10, sorry. Um, yeah. So, uh, all right, that moves us to uh, part two. Uh, the horrible demon beast, where which pretty much revolves around our final battle with the Titanics. Um, so Hugo's forced to retreat, uh, with Ryoma being taken with them. Uh, Titanics defeats Gingayo, but then it starts overheating because Shalinda is overexerting him. So the Balbon have to retreat before they can finish the Gingaman off. Uh, Hugo tends to uh, Ryoma's wounds. Uh, Ryoma was knocked unconscious, but he wishes. Ryoma to get back up again and says, you know, he pretty much voices his belief to his brother that he'll pull through. And he also li- leaves Ryoma's Seiju can outside so that Moat can find him. Uh, the um, Yuta finds Ryoma and starts, um, you know, trying to treat his injuries while the other Gingaman contemplate on how they're going to defeat Titanix. And Bukratis reveals to Hugo where Titanix's weakness is on its back due to its previous rotting. And uh, the Ball Bond detach the, their castle from Titanix's back. This is part of a big plan by Zahab that we're not really going to find out until two episodes later. Then they unleash the monster again. The, the Ginga men all um, try to take on Titanix and strike its back. Uh, Hyatt. They didn't find out from Huga. Hayate observed the weakness himself. And Abukratis frees Gotorus briefly so that Huga can fight with Boltorus. And at first, it looks like Ryama is dead, um, succumbing to his injuries. But then he recovers when he remembers a promise he made to Yuta that he's not going to lose and protect everyone. So he joins the fight. Um, and the um, and there's an all-out battle with Gingayo, Boltorus, Daitan... Um, Bull Taurus, the Steel Star Beast, and Titanix, and their ultimate, and they all work together to ultimately defeat Titanix once and for all. And, and immediately after the fight, Bull Taurus, uh, Go Taurus, and Huga get recalled by Bukratis. And the episode ends with the exhausted but triumphant Gingaman returning home, but the Balban are still in their castle because they apparently have a new plan up their sleeve. So, uh, yeah, what do we think about this one, guys? I'm gonna say first. I'll go for it. Oh, sorry. What I was gonna say was that, like, I actually admire how the villains, like, they didn't get mad, they didn't get upset. They were just like, "Oh, okay, oh, cool. All everything's going according to plan." Is up that like usually, you know, this would be the type of moment where like they lost their like giant beast or whatever. They start, you know, getting all in their feelings or whatever, but. This time, they actually were prepared for this. It was like, okay, we, this plan is actually going to work. I was going to say that this is a really epic type of battle, you know. 
big stakes on the line. Titanic's yeah. finally here. We've been hyping up Titanic for the better part of 40 episodes at this point. And I kind of felt like... So when I was watching this episode, when I'd seen the rest of it, I was starting to feel like, okay, so we did all that to have Titanic come in the first 42 episodes, and we still have like eight episodes left in the season. It shouldn't take eight episodes to defeat Sahab. What the hell's going on here? Why did they do it so quick? And I mean, I know they had like their little laughter at the end, but that was my initial reaction to it was it it seemed like we overhyped it and then he got defeated a lot easier than he said of. But I think that's all part of the master plan here. Um I do like the Rio Mahiaga scene quite a bit yep. in this episode. That that needs to be mentioned that Yes. Um that that interaction is basically everything you needed from like this entire like season because it's a cul- it's not really the culmination because there's still obviously more to do but it starts to bring to head um where the two brothers are in all this and where did it go from here as they start marching to the end game arc and i i just loved every second of them on screen together in this episode yeah, the the trust that Hyuga has in Ryoma to lead the Ginga man comfortably without him there, and the trust that Ryoma has that Hyuga's doing the right thing is without them outright saying it is just good. I, I love their dynamic and their trust in each other. It's so so good. Yeah, and again, like I I mentioned it in the last podcast, but like this is what I was talking about with like Ryoma just inherently being a better character than Leo because there's a second half to his character arc. And it took us a little bit to get there because as we all pointed out, there was kind of a little lull in the story where everything was stagnant for like most of the last batch. But now we're here and they're taking full advantage of this next part of Ryoma's story arc where he's once again been separated from his brother like he was, but this time he has a lot more confidence in himself and, you know, he's able to just trust his brother and mainstay, maintain a calm state of mind, even though for all intents and purposes, he probably shouldn't be able to. And you can definitely tell that if he, this was the Ryoma that we saw at the beginning of the series, he would not have been able to handle that nearly as great. So yeah. he also has Hugo's reassurance that he's had drilled into his head for however long it's been since he's been back. Like, it, yeah, yeah. Rioma's a true leader now, and it shows. Yeah, and I, I would comment, like, I definitely, I have to agree with Riz when I was watching this for the first time. I felt kind of a little uh, confused why they're killing off Diatonics uh, so quick. And we, we don't really know what's going to, well, we, we all know since we've watched those episodes, but we haven't gotten to that part yet. And but I don't want to give any comments on how I feel about this new change until we get to the episode that reveals the change. So I'm going to withhold my thoughts there. Yeah. No, I'm in the same boat as you, Nate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, I feel like this had a lot of powerful moments, uh, especially with uh, Ryoma and Huga. That's why I feel definitely not a 10, but it's definitely a um, a 9 for me. Yeah, ditto. Yeah, I was going to go yeah, with nine. nine as well. Okay, cool. All right, we can breathe for a little bit with this uh, next episode, Chapter 43, Legendary Footprints. This is pretty easy to talk about. It's a clip show episode where basically uh, Haruhiko has drawn a bunch of pictures of some of the Ginga Man's past adventures um, as part of the children's book that he's trying to write, and they all get scattered around, and while the Ginga Man are going around trying to collect them all they reflect on their past adventures uh there are some things to note about this episode though uh for example the english dub of the theme song is played in this episode as well um though they do play the japanese version over a montage of the gingham men's shiny moments and they also play the english dub of the ending theme which uh yeah they um i can't remember which sentai they stopped doing this but i do know 
I, I recall that I think they did it for Mega Ranger. I do remember them doing it for Go Go 5 too, but. I think for... it was just Mega Ranger through Time Ranger were the only ones that had this. Yeah. Yeah. But they did the English dub for the theme song, which was pretty cool because I like Ginga Man's English dub. I was wondering where they were going to put it, because I, I skipped this episode my first time watching this. I hate clip episodes. Uh, because the Mega Ranger one was used for the Car Ranger crossover movie for some reason. Oh, that's fitting. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of a surprise hearing it here. Even though it's English as can be. <laughs> well, it, it's English. So I... Okay, so... Riz, do you remember call? Let's say you didn't like the ending uh, theme of this um, show right here. What? Do you recall you didn't like the ending theme of this of this show? Yeah. I hate how it sounds in English. The ending song. Yes. I mean, I told you it's not a great song, but. He was, I mean, it's like he was struggling to get the words out when he was singing. I was like, good lord, man. Like, I still, the thing sounds, sounds okay in Japanese, but when you say it in English, it just sounds off. Like, ugh, it sounds terrible. But, uh, yeah, aside from that, none of the Gingaman transform in this episode. They only appear transformed in stock footage, and Hyuga only appears in stock footage in this episode. So, what do we think about this one? I don't care. Mm, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am going to award this. It's five and move on with my life. Okay, yeah, five. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, honestly, I hate clips, so it's a three. Clip, clip shows I'm are lazy. Because that's that song. That's the ending thing. <laughs> yeah, clip shows are lazy and boring unless you do what King Oger did and actually make it story relevant. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely see the hate for it, and I agree. But I will be honest, I skipped most of the clip, so I like fast-forwarded through the parts, hoping to find something plot-relevant like I did for King Oster, and there was nothing, so... I did the same thing. It didn't, it didn't yeah. honestly bug me, because I never watched it fully. If I probably watched it, I'd probably give it a three like you, but because I didn't watch it, uh, yeah, five. Alright, well, next up, so, uh, this next episode begins, so... It does begin a new part of a story arc, but more importantly, uh, these next couple of episodes are all like uh, focus episodes for the other four Gingaman, just to give them each a uh, final moment to shine before we uh, just start to wrap things up for the endgame arc. Uh, so in the case of this episode, chapter 44, Earth's Demon Beast. So this begins the story arc, but it's also a Goki focus episode. Uh, most of this it revolves around uh, Shunsuke, that that guy who's played by the same person who played Red Racer, who wants to win Suzuko's affection. Uh, you know, he's trying to become a bit more like Goki so that he can win over Suzuko's affection. Uh, and most of this episode revolves around Goki doubting his abilities because he feels that he's weaker than Hyuga because he's too idealist and kind. But then when he saves a little girl and her teddy bear, Shunsuke realizes why Suzuko loves him. And he says, hey, you're awesome the way you are and you shouldn't change who you are. And he concedes defeat and, you know, realizes that Goki and Suzuko are great together. Now, in terms of story, the big thing that happens here is that it's revealed that when the Gingaman defeated Titanix, the fragments of his body scattered and sank into the earth. And through that, it gave birth to a new monster, the Earth Demon Beast. This is um, the equivalent of that monster that appeared in the Lost Galaxy saga of uh, Lost Galaxy uh, Grunchor. Um, but, so there's a new Demon Beast in the Earth, and the Balbon are trying to enlarge it to a giant size with an extreme growth extract because they want it to be their new host of their ship at you know, pretty much do what Titanix was doing. And from this episode on, their plans revolve around them trying to give the Earth Demon, be try to locate the Earth Demon Beast and then give it a growth extract. 
So that's enough on the notes for this episode. What do we think about this one? This is the episode that made me love Goki. Just fully. I... He he's such a pure soul, and I can't hate him at all. <laughs> Wait, Patrick, hmm? it took you until here to fully love Goki. Well, in my first watch, do I liked him, but I was waiting until I saw everything from him before I fully like ranked him, and then this episode is what like sealed it for me. Dude, I had that sealed for him a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, but. Like, what the hell, man? I don't understand. Like, I mean, but I mean, like, it, it just sums up everything there is about oh, it definitely him that does. makes him so, yeah. such a good character. Yeah, definitely. But, uh... Like, like, like this thought of him, like, reaching for the teddy bear, like, I understand him, because I was like, no, save the bear! Do it! <laughs> <laughs> And they also gave a good moment to um, uh, uh, Shunzuki, how you pronounce his name? Yeah, Shunzuki. Because he he kind of misinterpreted everything, but then when he saw what it is that Goki was reaching for, while he was still wearing the you know holding the rubble up, and he understood, like it's such a subtle thing, but to give a like a two off side character an actual moment. I appreciate that. Well, they had to give him a moment to shine because he's right yeah. on the surf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, did you want to add anything, Ritz? Yeah. I was going to say, I didn't like the revelation about Titanic's turning into fragments to power this Earth beast living underneath the planet. Like, okay, that's just... Uh, I didn't like it. It bugged me yeah, a lot. Yeah, that even when I watched this thing for the first time, that was probably the one flaw that I could remember with Ginga Man that always still weighed on me. Like I I don't I don't think that this twist is necessarily bad, but you're doing it way too late. Like if you were gonna if you were gonna do this, you would have had to have at least had like the Titanics be like the main villain of like a mid season climax and then transition to like the earth demon monster. Like you should have done this way earlier if you were going to do it at all. Like how did it with Kia Razor? Yeah. Someone like that. Yeah. Cause that would have been better, but they didn't yeah. do that. And it honestly made me kind of annoyed that they sifted the they gave him the exact same like capabilities, exact same threat but they just said, oh, just kidding, we defeated you, and we are saying, screw you, you're going to have to uh, fight him again. But here's a new name for him. He's no longer Titanix. He's now the Earth Demon bo- Beast. And I'm just like, potato, potato, same thing. Just call him 2.0, for God's sake, and be done with it. And, and, and to be fair, I kind of get... I get a little bit of what they try to do. Like, so I, I watched the last three episodes of the in-game arc before I watched this. And without giving too much of a spoiler, the implication that I think they're giving here with how the Earth Demon Beast was born is that they're trying to imply that if you kill one of these big giant monsters, the Titanics, well, their body is just going to sink into the ground and then a new monster will be born and then the cycle will just keep repeating itself over and over again i feel like they try to imply that here they don't do it they don't do a really good job with that but like i feel again like if you want to if you want to reveal that i mean again it still would have worked a whole lot better if you just had Titanics be killed off at least maybe a little bit on maybe at least a little bit before Maybe no, no, no. A little bit after Huga joined the team as uh, Black as Black Knight. I mean, heck, considering how much we were complaining about how little was happening in the last batch of episodes, a final battle with Titanix would have actually been kind of preferable compared to some of the stuff we got in the last batch. The more you I know, now that it. you say it, having Titanix be revived and killed during the Ilias arc would have helped the pacing for this a lot. It would have made this. <clears throat> Probably a lot higher on my tier list than it already is. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I know where this falls on my tier list now. And it I think this arc, this revelation hurt the season as a whole for me. I don't on think it. I don't think it's like I understand like I, I don't agree with how they paced it, but I don't think it's a total deal breaker. Oh no, I'm not saying it's a deal breaker. I'm just saying it's the difference between one and you know, two, two and three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's just the difference yeah. between uh for in this case it's the difference of my three and four and my top five Sentai list. I mean, it would come down to a small detail like this. And yeah, I'll agree it's not as it wasn't well planned out. And it, it would have made been. And it would have made this Bado Boss story arc that we're currently in stand out a little bit better because, like, if you think back with like all these different generals, like they all had different methodologies. Like, Stan Bash was a bit more of a comic relief villain, like trying to wake up Titanics with some more like sillier things. Like, oh, I'm going to dispatch this monster to make some nice food that'll wake Titanics up. And then Budo was all about just trying to find the Gingalite. Then we have Ilias, who's more using like black magic and all that and then maybe she succeeds but then it dies and then we transition to the bado boss arc where everything that he's doing is all about just trying to revive this earth demon beast like yeah i didn't actually think about that until patrick brought it up but yeah Titanic's reviving would have been a whole lot better if we had it in the last batch yeah and it would have made a lot more sense than what we're getting right now but as as bad as the reveal with the Earth Demon Beast is, here's the thing. It first of all, it doesn't steal the focus from this episode too much. And Goki still gets a lot of great moments to shine. So despite all the criticisms I have there, I can't give this episode any less than an eight, because Goki is still really awesome in this episode. I'm giving it a nine solely because of Goki. <laughs> no, I'm following. Oh I'm following Nathan's rationale here to the T and saying this is an eight for the exact same reason Nathan said. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. Uh, Anthony, I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it a nine because it is Goki. Yep, Goki's you, my bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you want to add anything on your commentary for this episode, Anthony? I thought the episode was kind of hilarious too. Yeah, but I mean, you have Red Racer in it, so it has to be hilarious. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have chapter 45, The Fairy's Tears. This is Saya's last focus episode. Um, as And uh, there's actually some uh, pretty interesting things to note about this one, uh, even though it is kind of a filler. Uh, so the plot of this revolves around Saya trying to figure out how this mysterious girl offering her a flower can help the Ginga Man foil the Ball Bond's latest scheme. Now, uh, the the monster of this episode, Jane Saws, he did not appear um, in Lost Galaxy, so he's the last of the three battle boss monsters not to be adapted. But unlike the others, he was actually set to be adapted into an episode, but it ultimately got canceled, which brings me to this uh, last interesting fun fact. So this episode was not adapted into Lost Galaxy, but it was originally supposed to be uh, they were going to use footage from this episode to adapt an episode called Protecting Pink. It was going to take place immediately after The Power of Pink, and it was going to revolve around Cassie, who's just become the new Pink Ranger uh, following Kendrick's death. Uh, she's trying to befriend Maya, who's really cold toward her because of uh, Kendrick's uh, death. And apparently they completed and filmed the whole thing, but... Then they had to shelve it because Patricia Jali got into a contract dispute with Saban and walked off set. So they had to cancel this episode, and then they had to rush to put together a new episode, which ultimately became Protect the Quasar Saber, which was actually adapted using footage from the previous King of Man chapter we just reviewed. And anyone who's seen Lost Galaxy knows what ultimately happened. Carone became the Pink Ranger instead. Apparently, the script of the episode has been released online. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it. It was posted a while ago, so that source might have become eroded or something. But yeah, that that's pretty interesting. Uh, and we all know that like Cassie, um, Cassie leaving at the last minute was kind of a thing because there's actually one episode 
of Lost Galaxy where you can see Cassie standing in a place where Corone is supposed to be. It's that episode that revolves around Corone and Damon uh, turn up the volume. So yeah, just wanted to briefly point out that fun fact because I actually found out about that episode as I was writing the outline for this. So, but yeah, what mm, Saban this strikes again. Yep. Uh, but yeah, what do we think about this episode, guys? So I'm just gonna come out and say it. This is probably one of my favorite Saya focused episodes we've gotten. Yes. Uh, like, I I watched this episode I was like, dang, Saya really went hard on this episode. Like, sees first of all just dealing with the grief of you know the uh, Titanic's replacement thing, whatever Earth Demon but Beast, if you must be particular about the name, and she's putting a lot of emphasis on herself because she thinks she should have known or been able to detect this power and understood that this kid was actually the fairy that could help her. And she's getting all up in her feelings about not having understood it. And it's just such a heart-wrenching moment because she's going through so much already without really being able to express it. For example, she's talking about well, in the back of her mind, I'm thinking she's freaking out because Hyoga's been brought to being, uh, you know, the dark side a little bit. Yeah. And also, she's feeling bad because they have to deal with this unstoppable Earth Demon Beast monstrosity thing. And she's dealing with self-doubt because she didn't understand the fairy was the fairy. And she's getting mad at herself for not realizing it and saying, how can she be the warrior of the flowers if she can't even detect the flower fairy? And I just thought it's a fantastic episode. Even the little guy Boku got some time to shine in this one. Yeah. He, had, yeah. he helped wake Saya up by giving her a similar talk that she gave him and he freaking took on the monster and broke his saw. What the freak, man? <laughs> this guy's tough. <laughs> he would be. <laughs> yeah, but Saya yeah. was badass in this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just had to um, say it. <laughs> she really was. And I'm thinking that earned Saya a 10 for this episode. Oh, 10. Okay. Yeah, by the way, when Saya was crying, you know, you just kind of want to walk up to her and give her a big hug. Like, yeah, you're right, Riz. Like, Saya is very much like the Kotoha of this season. Because apparently, I guess, Yasuko Kobayashi needs that type of character in all of her seasons. Where was that character in Time Ranger? Well, I guess you could say that Shion was like that, because he's just an overall nice guy that you want to be friendly with and kind of protect, because he's yeah, just an innocent about to say. dude. Yeah, <laughs> But but that equivalence is Goki. Well, yeah, but Goki, I mean, Goki. Okay, let's be honest. Goki is just is just Domon if he wasn't nearly as charming. Like he's still a big strong guy who loves his friends and want. He's a bigger, stronger guy, but he's Goki without like the na- without the charm and womanizing personality. And I mean, but and hey, he got a girlfriend just like Domon did. So yeah, and hopefully he doesn't have to leave her behind. Yeah. Well. Okay, well, spoil we'll get there. In game art, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I know, I know, I, I, I've seen it, but um, yeah, no, this is a ten for me. Like, I don't care what you guys say. This is a ten because Saya is my is part of my favorite character in this entire season, and this solidified it for me. Yeah, like, it's, a, this it's is my a ten for me. Favorite selfless I would, character, I would say. It's more of an eight for me, honestly. I'd give it a nine. <laughs> Well, Anthony, you have no heart. <laughs> I guess not. She will. Call me Xanor, then, I guess. Call me Xanor. Did you want to add uh, anything else on your commentary on this episode, Anthony? Um, not really. I've just I a solid character. That's all I got to say. Yeah, and 
you know, I, I just want to bring this up again, like, before we jump into the next one, like, okay, there's a channel on YouTube called the Toku Cast, uh, just a shout out to them. And here's the thing, guys, of the Toku Cast, I really like your content and I respect you guys, but what were you guys thinking when you put Saya as like one of the top worst pink Sentai Rangers? What? Like, I, I love you guys. You're v- Get, you like, are very in- talented, but that's the one thing that you've done that I really don't understand. Guys. Honestly, I've honestly, and this is something that we haven't brought up in this podcast yet, but the four of us here have yet to understand what the internet's disdain for this season is. Every time anything Ginga Man related comes up, it's always a negative, and I do not understand it. I mean, no, I don't understand it either because I was talking to some people with Nate in the uh, Morph Anomaly Expo podcast, and I didn't understand why Ginga Man was a snooze fest for them. Uh, no, the more phenomenal guys were okay. It was the um, it was the Zenith people, dude. Oh, okay, okay, you're right. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> you're but right. They said, yeah, I don't want to badmouth the more phenomenal people. No, I don't want to badmouth any of them. I like all of them. Yeah, they They're they apparently awesome. thought that the that Ginga Man was boring, but I mean, okay, I respectfully disagree with that opinion. Not not that I've seen the entire season. I don't understand the hate, and like I've been on Reddit. A good bit this past couple of months and i see them talk about ginga man a lot and it's always like stuff like oh sneeze fest oh not a good season eh, not that great blah 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 i'm like dude are we watching the same thing because i don't think we are i mean half the time it seems like we're contrarian like a lot like some people would accuse us of being contrarian because this isn't the only opinion that we have that deviates from a lot of sentai like uh, most people like geki ranger we hate geki ranger yeah i know the subreddit the sentai subreddit kisses geki rangers butt all dude, the time you know it's what i've heard you no I've, I've seen you post comments on the subreddit <laughs> calling out people for liking <laughs> i i found your reddit and i've seen you trash geki ranger on the subreddit a handful of times <laughs> All the more hate and watch. But I, I just want to stress this. We're not trying to be intentionally contrarian. These are just opinions that come naturally to us. And it a lot of people they kind of preview the next Sentai that we're going to be reviewing. A lot of people most of the fandom hates the Sentai that we're about to start reviewing again. They despise it with really? a passion. Oh, Goanger is hated yeah. by a lot of the Sentai community. Really? And just so <laughs> people know, the three people in this group who have watched the season all the way through and Riz's opinion is still pending because he's actually watching the thing right now. We all love Go Onger. And again, we're not trying to be contrarian here. So I mean, okay. So, so I'm not, you know, meaningfully far into the season yet, but I've seen enough Go Onger at this point to where I think it's a decent season, but it's definitely not gonna be like, you know, top 10 or not top 10 but like top five material for me you know well it's not in my top five either yeah it's not top five material but it's it's a fun harmless season exactly it's a lot of fun i I enjoy the stupidity and i have to ask because i've been wondering do you like go on yellow because i feel like she's a character you would like (laughs) we will hold on to that until we get to the podcast review yeah fair enough Yeah, a lot of people apparently don't like her either, though, because there was this one guy who messaged me on my blog who asked me, like, hey, what do you think of uh, Go On Yellow? Because I haven't seen Go On, and people say that Go On Yellow sucks, which I don't think she sucks, but no, again, she's, well... Oh. She's nice. I, she's not a bad character. But yeah, we'll get to Go On when we get to it, Not fair, yeah. which is not going to we'll... be uh, too far from now. No, it's like a couple episodes away from where we are right now in terms of Tokyo Secret Podcasting. Yep. But anyway, to get back to Ginga Man, uh, we have Chapter 46, Winds do of Rage. Do we have to? Yes, we do. Uh, okay. There's not there's not much to talk about with this one. It's Hayate's Focus episode, um, which revolves around Shalinda using a vision of Hayate's fiance Miharu to lure him out for a final confrontation. Uh, and that's pretty much it with the notes. Nothing else to talk about with here. Okay. You know, 
I, I want to say something first. Go for it. When I watched Gingham Man the first time, I liked Hayate. And mm-hmm. honestly, I still do like Hayate as a character. But I didn't realize until this watch that, man, he gets shafted in the focus episodes, man. Good grief. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be short and simple with my thoughts here because he kind of put it in a nutshell pat. Hayate does not get any good, meaningful focus in this season whatsoever. Yeah. Like, it took me a little bit of going back down memory lane to even remember that in, I think, the first 10 episodes, they had a focus episode for him where they mentioned Miharu. So. They went from episode 10 to episode 46 with not a single real mention of Maharu, no mention of the fact that he had a fiance and that he's missing her or anything. And we focus more on him having a tomato allergy and a honey allergy. And that's his legacy to me, man. Is that those are his big legacy points. But he had the potential to have been written as the much better character, and he just wasn't. He's he's the weakest link in the team, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, for I don't, sure. Like, he has no real contribution to the team either. I mean, yeah, he had a couple of good moments with uh, Utah, but okay, cool, so what? Like, it didn't really matter. Yeah, like, so the problem with this episode is that if, if we look at this episode by itself, without taking the context of the rest of Ginga Man into context, th- this is actually pretty good stuff. I mean, Shalinda has a rivalry with Hayate, and she wants to have her battle with him, so she uses memories of his fiancé to rule him out. Like, I mean, that that should make you hate Shalinda, and it should make you feel for Hayate. But the problem is, Ginga Man has not earned an episode like this. Like, this is the first time in over 35 episodes that we've been reminded that Hayate even had a fiance. She hasn't even been mentioned since episode 10. And, you know, all of his filler episodes revolving around him. He has a tomato allergy. There's one episode where he gets stuck to Haruhiko with glue or when he's being slowly turned to stone or that really awful episode where that old man was messing with him. Like, Okay, some of those episodes were okay, and some of them were not so great, but you you probably needed at least two of those filler episodes to revolve around Miharu for this episode to really land. Yeah, like, have one of those episodes be Miharu's birthday, and he's doing, like, a celebration in honor of her, or, like, the anniversary in which they met, and, you know, just have stuff like that, you know, just make you it know, like been, a you know, reoccurring event. What? It's already written into the plot. We already have a hook for it. Yeah. But let him get jealous or sad. Oh, Goki. Goki. Oh, yeah. That would have been so good, actually. Like, if he, if we had Goki out becoming closer with his, uh, you know, like interest. Now. Yeah, yeah. Suzuko. And here's Hayate off in the corner feeling sad or angry or something. Dude, this would have made Hayate stocks rise. Because right now his stocks are on the toilet. Yeah, because out of the three seasons from... Who's the writer's name again, Nate? Yasuko Kobayashi. Kobayashi, thank you. There's always one character who's a very good character, but feels like that they were just shafted in the development. In Time Ranger, it was Shion... In Shin Kenjir, it was Mako. And here it's Hayate. Like, all three of them are good characters. They just didn't get the same amount of respect in the writing room as everyone else. And they're all different type of characters, too, if you look yeah. at it. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they struggled writing one type of character. It's just... There's just it one was... he for- she forgot. Yeah. <laughs> like, you could... Uh, like, you should get rid of that episode where... You know, he has to deal with that old man because that was an awful episode and maybe have it instead have it revolve around him. Like, I don't know, like maybe Miharu has a birthday. You could keep the setting of that tomato episode, except cut out the tomato 
plot and have it Suzuko was in that episode so you could have it revolve more around like Goki getting closer with Suzuko and then it reminds Hayate of Miharu a lot more and then I don't know I mean you could keep at least one of those stupid wacky filler episodes like the episode where uh he gets turned to stone because that was a half decent episode but yeah you there's like two or three Hayate episodes that would have been way better if you just injected a little bit of Miharu in there yeah I mean, definitely. Yeah, and it sucks because just like with Mako and Shion, I like Hayate as a as a character, as a person, but yeah, man, I don't know what they were thinking with just making his focus episodes throwaways. Yeah, and they make them look kind of dumb in some of the on too, like you know, the tomato one. The honey one, especially. Well, it's weird like, too because Hayate is one of the more serious personalities on this team. Yeah. But all of his focus episodes are like Three Stooges stuff. <laughs> they don't understand his character very well either. They should lean more, focus more on him, him and his rivalry with Shinam, Chanel, honestly. That should have been the main focus between him and him and, uh, and his episodes was that those two were so rivals. But yeah, so like I said earlier, there's a lot of genuinely good stuff in this episode that makes me want to like it, but it just doesn't feel learned. Now, I'm not going to give it a very low score because I didn't hate the episode. I'm taking off points more just because it doesn't feel earned, but I, I still want to give it a six just because I feel like it does deserve some credit for the good stuff that it has, but not earning it before bogs it down really badly yeah I, i'm still gonna give it a seven because genuinely this is the best hayate centric episode in the season without question but yeah you're right it doesn't have the proper build-up for it to really have payoff i think it just needed more miharu focus focus like she should have been like the forefront of his thoughts like i said I am having a hard time putting a number on this episode because I have two different ways of looking at it. One, this is a five for being a bland, like, for just high to having a, getting sapped so much. On the other hand, I just hate how they ruined Hayate's character and didn't do anything with him. And my anger wants to make me give it a one. So I can't decide where to put it. <laughs> I think I'm going to just... What? No, go ahead. I think I'll just average it to a three. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Because I know Hayate... Like, when I first started watching the season, and we got through the first 10 episodes, I remember thinking, okay, Hayate probably is going to be one of my favorite characters. Because he's got this really awesome, like, backstory building up. And then I forgot the backstory existed. And now that we're here at the end game arc, I'm kind of mad that we didn't get anything out of it. Yeah, that's fair. But, uh, yeah, we're going to... Uh, Anthony, did you want to add anything? Um... I said I did enjoy the episode, but like y'all said, like y'all said, y'all made some good points when it comes to like Hayate. Like, like it's, like y'all said, he is a good character. He is a good, I guess, person, and and but he just needed something to do. He needs something to do in his focus episodes. He just wasted his time, honestly. Yep. Well, okay, uh, we're gonna wrap up uh, this. Uh this uh podcast with uh the episode analysis at least with chapter 47 the demon scheme uh so like i said these last couple of episodes all um have given uh everyone one last uh focus episode so we've done goki we've done saya we've done hayate so who's left that's right hikaru so uh this is his last episode and uh Considering they've been trying to do a sort of kind of ish rivalry between hikaru and bisnella well there's also a little bit of Biznella uh, business here. So Biznella puts a plan together both to have the Gingaman killed and summon the Earth Demon Beast. 
and Hikaru is the only one who can stop him. So uh, Biz now tries to lure um, the Earth Demon Beast out with. So he tries to lure the Ginga Man out with a fake Earth Demon Beast, and then take them out with a bomb. And he supposedly does, except uh, Hikaru was captured. So Hikaru was the only one who could really uh, respond. But then the other Ginga Men are revealed to have survived. And Hikaru, while fighting back, he he uh, pushes Biznella into a vat that has the extreme growth extract that he was going to give the real Earth Demon Beast. And that causes him to take on this uh, new form, which looks similar to the Earth Demon Beast. Uh, that, uh, for the, for the Lost Galaxy Watchers, this is Deviat's mutated form that he had in that one episode. Um, and uh, the Ginga Man summon, uh, well, um, so the Ginga Man first defeat him with their Beast Strikers, which have been upgraded by Moak so that they have these jagged edges. And you should remember that uh, plot point because it's going to play a little bit in the in-game arc, which we're going to be taking a look at next time. But uh, after that, Bado Boss injects him with an extract to enlarge him. Then he abandons Biznella, and the Ginga Men defeat him with Gingayo and the uh, Steel Star Beasts. And now, um, with the uh, Earth Demon Beast having been discovered, everyone knows that the real fight is about to begin. But we'll talk about that next time. So, uh, but yeah, what do we think about this episode, guys? Hikaru's focus episode. Hikaru being thinking he was alone still said screw this i'm killing you two idiots <laughs> he, dude Hikaru's he, socks are writhing he can't he's right. come a long way and i agree with you nate going into this rewatch he was probably my least favorite of these guys he's he's skyrocketed up my list of favorite ginga men dude. <laughs> easily okay i will say it again this is twice I do a podcast with y'all where we start off with the season with at least one of us saying, oh, well, this is the weakest character to bunch. So you're not going to really have much feelings about him. And then, bam. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm looking at you, Nate, for Sion last season. I'm looking at you all for saying Hikaru this season because screw all of y'all. Hikaru is amazing. Yeah, for sure. And the, the other note I want to say is this episode kind of annoyed me in the fact that Biznella should have been a prominent villain more often because his plans are actually pretty engaging compared to every other idiot that the Balaban has put in charge. If they had Biznella from the get-go, they probably would have won. Yeah, he's genuinely a good tactician because his plan almost worked. <laughs> Like, I so, feel like he could have stopped him from getting a Ginga Light. He probably could have. But it's also funny that when they were fighting him with Gingayo, the Steel Star Beast came up and was like, hey, dickhead, we want a piece of you too. <laughs> Look what you did to <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, that was probably the one time that the Steel Star yeah, Beast brought Ryoma really looked up and was like, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, we're punching him. This is our business. <laughs> <laughs> Revenge. Oh right, I, I was I was I wasn't go first, but I, I was like, nah, it's fine. I'll let y'all say what y'all want to say first. Uh, what do you want to say, Biznella? You are out of business permanently. Ha! Oh, that was the. Uh... <laughs> that was a very lost <laughs> galaxy thing to say. <laughs> I regret that. Hey, I said what I said. Hey, Anthony. See, that's the problem. You should regret it. <laughs> No, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. No, whatever you're gonna say, I don't care. No, 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 hold up, hold up. Let me get it out. Hey, Anthony, the bond call. They want their writers back. Okay. Like I said, I regret nothing. So yeah, whatever you say is not gonna affect me whatsoever. Oh no, I know it's not gonna affect you, but I still have to make the joke that the bond writers are locked away in your closet somewhere, and you gotta give them back now. Come on. <laughs> But yeah. Oh, ha ha ha. Hasbro needs something to work with to write a next season of Power Rangers. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last toe. But, no, it's in your closet. Like, no, but on, honestly, that would be a line that one of the Rangers would say if uh if oh, yeah. Deviot's name was Biznella. Because I mean, even in like some of the really good seasons, they have to do really big puns, like uh like in Power Rangers in Space when they destroy 
Psycho Blue, TJ has to say, all right, Blue Psycho Ranger singing the blues. Like, those types of bad puns. Yeah. Oh, no, it was a good pun. I'm just saying, like, that that's writing, that writing's been around since the good old days. That's true. Uh, but do we want to add uh, any more about uh, this episode or just give it our rating out of 10? I'm ready to score it. Okay. Nine. 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 All right, that'll make it unanimous. Nine all around the board. Uh, okay, so uh, we don't really have to talk about... Well, I guess the best thing about the villains is that Biz Nella was kind of an entertaining bit, but I, I, we could probably talk a little bit about Bucarati's, but I want to wait until the endgame arc to really talk about him. Yeah, oh, I, I was going to hold up on that. One more thing I wanted to say is that this is the moment that Biznella got what he deserved because of what he did to. Why am I blanking? It was uh, Lorax. Dagius. Lorax, Lorax, kind of hard. Degius. Yeah, Degius. Yeah. Because same thing happened to happen to him because of uh, Batpas. Yeah. Now, ironic, Hikaru was the focus character of both episodes too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but we don't have to talk about the villains uh, too much. So, uh, yeah, I guess the, we'll wrap this up the way we usually do. Uh, just by uh, uh, technically, I have updated rankings on this outline, but uh, we're just going to do what we've been doing lately and just give our tier rankings for each of the Ginga men. So, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I'll be very brief. Everybody's an S except for Hayate, who's like a low A, high B. Oh, he's a B for me. We're we're pretty much the same. We're pretty much the same. Um, patch. I'm I'm making yeah. it to a B. Honestly, it's not like the fact I don't dislike him. I just I'm just disappointed no, by it. It's I I, I like him, but the I like him, but the writer's disrespect for him lowered his ranking. Yeah, that's why I can't put him any lower than that. Because <laughs> it's not Hayate's fault; it's the writer's fault. <laughs> uh, where would you rank the other ones for your tiers, Anthony? Oh, I, I said the same thing as uh, as Patrick, but I, but mine is high tier is a B, and uh, everybody else says S tier. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And uh, Riz. So Ryoma S tier, Goku's S tier, Hikaru's S tier, Saya's S tier, Kiyoga's S tier, high tier C tier. I'm sorry. Now, well, you always are the more harsh when it comes to stuff than I am. You really so, I guess... are, <laughs> so I'm not surprised you put him lower. <laughs> I expect better because they had given him a great story in the beginning. Yes. And then we get oh. tomato allergies. <laughs> <laughs> and a honey allergy. Let's not forget the damn honey. Like, you know what I'm going to do tomorrow for lunch? I'm going to eat some tomatoes. With honey on top. Spice. Oh, Lord, man. That actually, that actually sounds disgusting, by the it way. It does. I'm not actually going to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> Your stomach is like, thank you. <laughs> Don't make me go through that. <laughs> uh, for me, um, I'll pretty much agree with uh, most of you guys. Uh, so, Ryoma, Goki, Saya, and Huga are all S tiers for me. Uh, Hikaru, I don't know if I can put him as an S tier, although I'm tempted to, but I'm probably going to put him as a high A tier, but I still want to give Hikaru a lot of credit because, I mean, he's definitely the biggest riser here because I had him as a D tier before I started, uh, watching this. So yeah, I, Hikaru is definitely one of those characters where you might need to rewatch the series again to kind of appreciate him, but or be Ridzwan and watch the first time and see the beauty of him. Yeah, that too. Um, Just saying, but, all three of y'all missed the boat the first time, and I didn't. Although, he reminds me a lot of Chiaki from Shin Kinger, and I have Chiaki listed as in, as the only S-tier green. So yeah. maybe I would have to tempt to put him as S tier, I don't know. I'm gonna have to. Maybe that's what it is because that. you're right. That's actually a good comparison, but I think Chucky might still be a better written character. Oh yeah, Chucky's yeah, better. Chucky's better. Yeah. Like if we were to do a comparison between uh, 
Ken Kinder and Ginga Man, and we had to put uh, Chiaki up against Ikaru. Chiaki would probably win that matchup. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or none. Me and Nathan actually did a quicker version of the Ken Kinder versus Ginga Man on a call the other day. Uh oh. And not like a review, nothing for the podcast. Just, yeah, just for fun. Yeah, just for fun. And yeah, that was one of the matches that we were like, yeah, Chiaki wins this one. Yeah. <laughs> But Hikaru is still a really good character, and uh, for Hayate, here's the thing. If you go back, if the people who are listening go back and listen to the previous podcasts, I was hoping and praying that Hayate, because Chiaki's getting kind of lonely up there, is the only green in the S tier, and I was hoping that Hayate could give him some company, but yeah, there's literally no hope for Hayate to be able to do that now. I, I don't want to be as harsh as Riz, but... Yeah, he's probably a low A tier, probably high B tier for me. Um, yeah, because he's just kind of a ultimately. I mean, he's a great he's a great character by himself. But I, I don't know. He's a lot like, uh, ironically, some other Green Rangers that are underappreciated, like uh, Hikari from Tokyo or uh, Anthony's guy uh, Kyoryu Green Soji, like someone who's great but yeah. sadly just doesn't get the focus that he deserves. Um, Oh exactly. yeah, Kyoryu, Kyoryu Green is a really good example of that because he has so many shining moments, but then I don't remember anything about him. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah, Sentai Riders, why do you keep why do we constantly get Green Rangers that are very interesting characters, but you just don't want to give them focus? What do you have against Green Rangers? They're green with envy. The thing with I can't really say that with Kira May Green because she gets good development, but she but there are times where she like she could have gotten more focus, but like I don't know. You have to watch watch the series for yourself to get what I mean. Yeah, but, but I will I will comment on something that Nathan said a little while ago. Y'all call him Nihars for giving him a C, but here's Nathan giving Hikaru a D. Okay, but again, in my defense, I was some dumb 20-year-old person who just always kind of got annoyed by those types of people, okay? Like, I, and again, this is also the same Nathan that kind of got a little inner, that was suckered in by G-Rangers, like, fantasy elements, not really realizing how bad of a show it was. So that was a different Nathan. And Gekki Rangers Kung Fu elements. Yes, exactly. That was a different Nathan. Well, I'm glad that Nathan's gone. Yeah, thank God. Um, but yeah, uh, so, gentlemen, what do we want to say for our closing thoughts before we prepare to enter the in-game arc? Let's go! Yeah, I, I remember Ginga Man's ending being pretty, pretty hectic. And I mean that in a good way, so. Yeah, it's a fun little ending I'm I'm looking forward to talking about it next time. And uh, Anthony, you want to add anything? I'm just ready for the last uh, two rides. All right. Well, uh, in that case, guys, that wraps up our penultimate Ginga Man cast. Uh, next time, we will be reviewing the three-part in-game arc, chapters 48, 49, and 50. Um, after and we'll be giving our final analysis and grade on Ginga Man after that, and then uh, we'll um, we're going to be uh, taking a little bit of a break from recording. Though we'll, we're still going to have podcasts uh, posted um, weekly, but uh, we're going to be taking a little bit of a break so that uh, some of these guys can get ready to like uh, watch Lost Galaxy because we are going to do a Lost Galaxy review. Now we're not going to do a comparison. Uh between Ginga Man and Lost Galaxy, because I think we've all come to the agreement that that would just be another bloodbath. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's just a brief announcement. And then after the Lost Galaxy review, uh, we'll get ready to do the our next Sentai, Engine Sentai Go Onger, which we've kind of decided, which we originally we wanted to do Go Busters, but we kind of decided to do Go Onger because we fell in love with Boom Boonger's wacky shenanigans, and we decided to, hey, let's take a look at another Sentai that's very similar to that. So, um, yeah, we hope you guys will check out all those podcasts. Um, and we thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen. If you guys have any uh, 
thoughts on Ginga Man, you know, you can leave your comments down below. Um, you know, especially those who aren't as big of a fan of Ginga Man, we'd uh, be very happy to hear your perspective on that. But with that said, we will see you guys next time when we uh, finish up Ginga Man for the end game arc. But until then, bye for now. If you enjoyed listening to the Tokyo Secrets podcast, please check us out at AnimeSecrets.org and follow us on all our social media pages such as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also feel free to check out our other podcasts, including Anime Declassified and The Jedi Squadron. You can also leave us any feedback you'd like to offer us directly on our website. If you're listening to this on Spotify or iTunes, we thank you so much, and please leave us a rating out of five stars. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel if you're not already subscribed and leave any comments down below, as we love to take the time to read comments left on our channel and give our fans, you know, shout outs. If you have any seasons of Super Sentai, Power Rangers, or other Tokusatsu shows that you'd like for us to check out, please don't hesitate to say so in your feedback. With all that said, we thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our podcast, and we will see you next time as we continue our never-ending journey through the world of Tokusatsu. But until that time, you all stay safe, we love you, and may the power protect you.